We're going to devote our energies to sports and gardening, all the cultural pursuits as far as they're concerned. In fact, we're going to put the dooms to sleep. Meanwhile, we dig. Greetings from Tbilisi, Georgia. This is the Anadromist, Burn Power, coming to you on a nice, mellow day. It's in the low 70s, mid 70s, not too hot. It is mid October, but uh, it's fine weather. And, you know, I thought I would do something different today. I've been doing these extended series, I did one. I'm in the middle of one on how we got here, which is going to take longer than I thought because I have to be careful with what I say. Not that I'm afraid. If I was sitting there talking to you, I would say anything. Nor am I afraid too much of how people will interpret it. But I am afraid of saying the wrong thing. So I, that is to say, I, I want to get my facts straight. Um... And the other series that I'm almost done with is my series on time. But this is going to be, for me, a little vacation. Uh, and what we're going to do is someone suggested that uh, I, should, I should have a book list of things I recommend. And I thought about that for a bit. And I said to myself, hmm, well, why not? So, um, and I thought about this anyway. Uh, you know, books, you know, uh, it seems like a lot of people were watching those Jordan Peterson videos and he would rec make all these recommendations. And I always kept saying, well, yeah, but what about this book? And what about that book? And what about this book? Uh, uh, so, so maybe this is books to go, you know, once you've done Jordan Peterson or, or just are discovering the channel and uh, want more books about, that give you an, uh, an interpretation of life that... Uh, at least correlates to how I see things. And maybe you would disagree. I'm sure you would. So who cares? <laughs> you know, uh, you make your own list. That's why we have YouTube videos. Uh, I can't cover all the subjects you'd like me to cover, but I can try to give you the world as I see it. And if you find that interesting, that's good. And if you don't, hey, that's life. So I thought I would give you some of the books that have and the authors that have been the most uh, influential in my own thinking over the years. I started seriously reading in the mid-1970s and, of course, have continued since then. And some books and authors have really stuck out as being really important to me uh, and helped me quite a bit in understanding this strange world we now live in. Uh, and it is a strange world. Um, but I've never been really surprised by any of it. I haven't been surprised by the insanity going on in social media. I haven't been surprised by the fact that we live in a world that's so divided. Um, I haven't been surprised by the fact that people are pickled in propaganda. Why? Because of the authors that I've read. They prepared me. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give you some of those authors. Now, what I'm not going to do is I'm not going to give you uh, the authors who were... Uh, I'm not going to give you classic writers like Kierkegaard or Dostoevsky or Pascal, all of whose work is relevant to the present, but I think far enough removed uh, that there's not a lot that is immediately applicable but a lot of principles that you can apply to the present, just as the Bible has, you know, the Bible obviously doesn't talk about social media. It doesn't talk about television sets. It doesn't talk about cars. Uh, so one could say, well, the Bible isn't relevant to the world we live in, but of course the Bible is tremendously relevant. Uh, and one has to understand how to read it and the principles. Um, I did an interview with a good friend of mine, John Sandry, whose work in biblical uh, exegetical studies have been tremendously important to my own thinking. 
and uh, I have a link somewhere around here um, that might help you understand uh, reading the Bible in the 21st century. But I don't want to do that. So many people discuss biblical things, and um, my feeling is that sometimes those words uh, from the Bible, Christian words, since I'm a Christian, they just uh, get overused. They get turned into, as I've mentioned in my time discussions, turned into visual propaganda, and they cease to have the reality and the truth that they really do have. So, um, I also am not going to be covering any fiction because I think fiction is a very different species. It's an art more than it is uh, a discussion of reality or a discussion of truth or a discussion of the world we live in. So, uh, I don't read fiction to understand how to, you know, navigate the world I live in. I read fiction to understand how someone else has seen the world and they use a story to discuss it. And yes, there is truth in fiction, but there is also a lot of imagination. And I think that's a slightly different way of approaching truth. So I'm not doing fiction here. So that means I won't be discussing, say, The Lord of the Rings or uh, or the works of Edgar Allan Poe or Shakespeare or anything like that. So these, and again, these are just authors that have meant something to me. I have not tried to be inclusive. I've not tried to make sure there's an equal number of women and men. I have not tried to make sure we have all ethnicities represented or any, you know, a lot of these people are now in the category of dead white men. Who cares? I mean, if that's an issue to you, you can just stop watching now because I don't actually care. I care about what has influenced me in seeing the world. And if many of them happen to be uh, white males, so be it. So, uh, you know, and, uh, you know, if you found sustenance in all sorts of other writers, well, that's good. So uh, I'll leave it there for now. Um. So let us start, actually I'm going to start with an author whose work isn't particularly interesting to read. I mean, it is good, but, but it's not his reading that gets me, it's his lectures that got me. And that's the uh, Dutch art historian Hans Ruckmacher. And if I would say one thing, if you could get one thing from all of this, only one thing, all, from all the rest of this, is start here. And because this lecture by Rookmacher called What is Reality is like the Rosetta Stone of the rest of this. It's, it doesn't include every author that I mention here, but the way he's discussing the nature of reality opens the doors on the rest of the comments below. So if you were to start with Barfield or start with uh, C.S. Lewis or start with Solzhenitsyn or start with uh, Michael Polanyi, um, Ruckmacher is like a key. In his concise questions about reality, he opens the doors. And I feel that a lot of times if you start with Polanyi, it's like someone just pushed you into the deep end of the pool. And I think for most people... If you don't know how to swim, it's going to be a problem. Whereas Ruckmacher gives you instructions on how to swim. And that's the important thing about Ruckmacher. So I would suggest, you know, before you start writing notes on, ooh, this one, this one, go to Ruckmacher's What is Reality lecture, which I have linked below. And you'll probably see some little banner above by the time I'm done here. Oh, no, I can't actually put a, a banner on him uh, because it's not uh, connected to uh, YouTube videos. So... Look below. That Go there first. I mean, if you're at all skeptical about what I'm saying, just go there and listen. Just because if, like I say, that is the Rosetta Stone to the rest of this. If you, if you, I have listened to that lecture since I first heard it in 1978. I would see it at least 40 times. And it's got that much density to it. Um, because what he's actually saying there sounds simple. 
But if you wrestle with that and his questions about reality, the rest of this is going to, it's like I said, you've got the key. The rest of this is like, you know, you're, you're in the deep end of a very murky pool and you don't really understand where you're going. You'll be talking about a lot of deep concepts. And, and that's my problem with just say throwing someone into philosophy or something. Suddenly you have all these deep concepts, but what you're missing is the way to connect those concepts to the world you're walking through day to day. And that's what Ruckmacher does. And that's why for me, he is like probably the most influential person, uh, along with maybe C.S. Lewis. But Ruckmacher, of all the Libri thinkers, his is the only work I really recommend always because he had something different up his sleeve. So if you haven't listened to the lecture by Hans Ruckmacher, What is Reality?, you should just go do that. And it doesn't matter who you are. You're going to get something out of it. What you're going to get is deep questions about the world you're walking in right now. Even though this lecture was from 1976, right before he died. And do you get the point yet? <laughs> it's the only time I'm going to emphasize anything like this during this uh, discussion. Uh, he does, have, there is a complete... Uh, book of his works. It's about six volumes long. It's expensive. And the What is Reality is featured there as a, uh, you know, a transcription. But I would say it's listening to Ruckmacher that gets it. So what is the problem today as I see it? And the, the problem is that we get to get fat again out of our thinness. And we got to get fed again to rediscover reality. And I really mean it when I say to rediscover reality. We have lost the knowledge of reality. And when I talk about reality, I also mean suffering, sin, the curse. One of the most interesting and, to my thinking, very crazy things that I found is that theologians have written many, 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 many books on the grace of God. How many books have they written on the curse of God? We barely know what the curse means. Nobody has really thought about it. Nevertheless, if we don't know what the curse is, how can we know what reality is? How can we know whether a natural law really can be counted on if we don't know whether this reality can be counted upon because we don't know what the curse means? I think we really got to think more about what the curse means and, of course, suffering and sin in that relationship. If we want to regain rediscover reality. Um, he's also really funny when you listen to him. <laughs> I mean, I, I never ceased to laugh at him, even years later after hearing the same things. Along with that, if you're interested in art, I would highly recommend his series of questions and answers on art and culture that was given at Westminster Seminary also in 1976. And this was the year before he died. He died of a heart attack in early 77, and I regret never having had a chance to meet him. He would have been in his prime, he was like in his 50s, I believe, when he died, and he would have been in his intellectual prime had I met him when I went to Labrie in 1978. So I'm just going to say that. Here are some of the writers that really have uh, affected me. We'll start with some of the people who were the, uh, related to the Inklings. So. Obviously, C.S. Lewis uh, is a very important influence. I am not going to mention uh, or discuss at all any of his obvious stuff. No Chronicles of Narnia, no Screwtape Letters, no Space Trilogy, no, uh, you know, Miracles, no Mere Christianity, and Problem of Pain, all the obvious stuff that, like, litters, literally litters all Christian bookstores. And uh, litters it, and people don't seem to get it still. But uh, because these things have been done to death, I think part of it is the Macmillan Company has had a stranglehold for so long on, on the Lewis market. But the stuff that really, that I find the best, I, well, uh, A Grief Observed is a really great book. I, all, uh, you know, Lewis is almost always great, but the stuff I find the best is things like uh, the abolition of man. That's a good starting place for me, for Lewis as a thinker, because it's a short book, 
And yet it deals with such profound subjects. I mean, short as in like, what, less than 100 pages. And yet deals with profound topics. When I first read this, I suddenly realized, oh, there was this weird problem of manipulation and propaganda in the world. And we are being, in a sense, through what we consume uh, in our environment through reading and and watching things we are being influenced all the time to become something that may not be fully human hence the title the abolition of man that's all i'm going to say about that a friend of mine once said that c.s lewis said in the abolition of man uh what jack alol took about 10 books to say <laughs> <laughs> and that's how good the abolition of man is. I would say that's a great starting place for reading here in all of these. Next, my favorite C.S. Lewis book is The Discarded Image. And this Discarded Image is a book dealing with um, C.S. Lewis was a medieval historian. Well, he studied philosophy, he studied literature, he knew the Middle Ages really well, and he knew how they looked at things. And this is C.S. Lewis's uh, discussion of how people in the Middle Ages looked out through their eyes at the universe. And if you look at this and read this, you will change how you look at the world now. For one thing, the view of the Middle Ages will not seem crazy. People who talk about the Middle Ages, people in the Middle Ages being full of uh, just stupid superstitions and how much more evolved we are, really have no leg to stand on. And if you read this book, by the time you're done, you will understand that. Because he also, at the very last chapter of the book, and this is like the crux, in the very last chapter he says, now... Yeah, you know, uh, many of you will be itching to tell me that, uh, of course, the people in the Middle Ages were wrong. But he said, what does that really mean? In fact, let me read it for you. I hope no one will think that I am recommending a return to the medieval model. I am only suggesting considerations that may induce us to regard all models in the right way, respecting each and idolizing none. We are all, very properly, familiar with the idea that in every age the human mind is deeply influenced by the accepted model of the universe, but there is a two-way traffic. The model is also influenced by the prevailing temper of mind. We can no longer dismiss the change of models as a simple progress from error to truth. No model is a catalogue of ultimate realities, and none is a mere fantasy. Each is a serious attempt to get in all of the phenomena known at a given period, and each succeeds in getting in a great many. But also, no less surely, each reflects the prevalent psychology of an age almost as much as it reflects the state of that age's knowledge. Hardly any battery of new facts could have persuaded a Greek that the universe had an attribute so repugnant to him as infinity. Hardly any such battery could persuade a modern that it is hierarchical. It is not impossible that our own model will die a violent death, ruthlessly smashed by an unprovoked assault of new facts, unprovoked as the Nova of 1572. But I think it is more likely to change when, and because, far-reaching changes in the mental temper of our descendants demand that it should. And so we find ourselves confronting a world where we have different models of the universe, but all of our models have to be on some level wrong. Because the real world is far greater than any simple model. And also in our models... You know, it's just like he, he considers the caveman a myth, which I think is really brilliant because, in fact, this image, it's always like the, the cave, the cave people were running around, men were clubbing each other, dragging women by the hair. You see this in cartoons and stuff all the time. And, you know, whereas the, after thinking about this for a while, I realized, you know, these prehistoric people didn't run around acting like dogs. 
You know, they looked at the moon and they wept. Just like we do. You know, or just like we would if the moon was visible through our visual pollution. Um, An Experiment in Criticism is a great book. Again, these are all books related to what used to be called literary criticism. Now what's called literary criticism is like all this uh, modern, uh, you know, the general critical theory, which is all this postmodern stuff. And I don't put a lot of faith in it because it, it destroys rather than allows you to the, the past to breathe. Lewis has a great uh, essay, and, and his essays are always great, by the way. So there's all these books full of his essays. But he has a great essay talking about the value of old books to correct our modern thinking. And he said the books of the future would be great if, to read to correct our modern notions, but we can't get at them yet. But the old books are there. And the past, in some sense, is more solid than this thing we're standing on because it's already happened. And in order to get to the future, I think we have to have access to the past. And Lewis is great at doing that. In an experiment in criticism, he discusses something really unusual. His experiment is this. Rather than saying, oh, that's a bad book, and that's a good book, he says, no, there are bad readings and good readings. And, and a book which wouldn't be so good would be a book that didn't allow for good readings. Um, that is to say, a book, he talks about how often when we read uh, books, uh, some books will, they kind of almost give us these sandcastles in our mind that we build for ourselves. And in these sandcastles, we see ourselves as the uh, heroes and heroines. Uh, we see ourselves as mirrored in the people. And, and so he said, those are bad. Those books are not so good and because they tempt us towards bad readings. Now, he says not every book that does that is a bad book. But, um, and you can really see this, uh, a, a genre I have never found anything good in is romance. Now, I don't mean the old romance of like... Uh, Jane Eyre and, uh, you know, uh, Daphne du Maurier and, and these, you know, the books from the past. I'm talking about the modern, uh, you know, genre of romance fiction, which is just like churned out, uh, by the publishers. And I've picked them up and read them in the stores, tried to make sense of them. A lot of times they just end up being really lengthy descriptions of pornographic acts. Uh, other times they're just like, you know, the woman is going to make the man into the image she wants her to be. It's just total, uh, you know, fantasias on my own personal sandcastle. This is the way I like the world. I think a lot of fantasy literature works that way for people, too. And, you know, and I like Lewis, and I like Tolkien, and I like classic fantasy, and I like fairy tales. And, I, you know, I love horror films and such, but I think a lot of... of you know, like world building fantasy tends to encourage people just to create their own little universes in their head, their own characters, and not, again, not to connect to the world. And, you know, to me, the Lord of the Rings connects to the world because it is such a well made world. But if someone just invents their own little world and in their own video game and creates this, it's, there's no depth to it, you know, because it's not about real experience. Uh, but experiment and criticism, do that. Following with that study in words, studies in words, um, Lewis breaks down simple words like nature or free, or he even has a short section on the English phrase, and Americans don't really say, say this much, you know, I dare say, uh, which is funny. But he breaks down uh, the words and shows how they change over time. This is a great companion work to Owen Barfield's uh, work, History and English Words. You can just put this under the Owen Barfield category. I'll say it again just to remind you. But Studies in Words and History in English Words are like companion pieces. And what Lewis does is he really follows a few words into the past to show how they developed and how their meanings keep evolving and changing. But history in English words, Barfield's and uh, book, and I'll mention this now, but just say it when we get to Barfield again. 
uh, really is more of a philosophical treatise on how words have not only evolved, but how we our words have gone from being full and deep to being prosaic and shallow. And this is really important to understanding how we got to where we are. This is correlates directly with Barfield's uh, other work, which I'll mention in a moment. But let me uh, just f- f- end up with one more book, uh, Preface to Paradise Lost. Um, even if you're not planning on reading uh, John Milton's great work, Paradise Lost, I highly recommend this. It's about, I don't know, 75-page, 100-page preface to Paradise Lost. And what he really, there's some amazing uh, sections in here. One where he talks about, you know, how we think that, uh, w- you know, we've been living in civilization for a while. And, and Lewis's idea is that, you know, basically after Paradise Lost, we left civilization. After that era, uh, the 17th century. And I tend to, the more I look at it, the more I tend to, to agree. And we become more barbaric the more our materialist uh, world takes over. Now, I'm talking about Western Christendom and all this, there's a lot going on. But but anyway, I, I highly recommend a preface to Paradise Lost. Let's go on to the next figure. Uh, let's go to Owen Barfield. Barfield is one of Lewis's oldest friends. He is what Lewis called the, the anti-self, uh, the person who has, is interested in everything you're interested in and has, really has gotten a lot of the wrong ideas in it. Lewis never had much truck with Barfield's anthroposophy. How's that for a word? Rudolf Steiner's philosophy. And I kind of agree with Lewis on this side. I think uh, Steiner really gets a little too involved on the occultic end of things. And I think, in a way, what happened was Barfield had really great ideas. Kind of used Steiner as a jumping-off point. Uh, But... But Barfield's ideas all by themselves are quite interesting, and they are a bridge between Lewis's ideas and many other ideas that might later be called New Age ideas. But I don't think Barfield is really what we would call a New Age writer by any degree. Of course, Barfield's classic work, if you're going to read one work by Owen Barfield, it should be Saving the Appearances, uh, subtitled A Study in Idolatry. And what he means by this is that our world used to be very different. And, you know, on one level, this is obvious. You know, the world has changed. But what it is, is we tend to think we've reached the pinnacle of evolution. Barfield's view is very different. Barfield thinks what's happened is we have hardened... Now, when Bar, uh, he t- uses this word participation... Rookmacher really gets into a Barfield's participation word in a way which I think... Uh, this is why I suggest starting with Rookmacher and not Barfield, because the tendency is to interpret uh, Barfield's participation in your own way. And you really can't do that. Barfield's word participation specifically means going is the person sees the insides of things. So it's this old pagan view where, you know, you see the spirits in the trees, you see the, you know, the, 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 the spirits in uh, the, the, the dirt and the soil, the land, the sun. Everything is filled with the spiritual significance, which sounds really great to New Age people until you realize also that means it's all filled with taboos and things you can't do and things you don't touch. There's a reason why tribes don't change for you know millennia in certain places. Why? Because they have to do the same things over and over and over again. And so something was needed to break that uh, chain of participation. And one of the things that happened was, and Barfield says in one of his most brilliant lines, one of the most unlikely things that ever happened. Unlikely if all there is is random materialistic evolution. And that is that one group of people suddenly decided we do not participate in the world. That is say, God is not connected inside of everything. That is say, not in the sense that, you know, we are all God. And what Barfield says instead is that the Jews suddenly said, God is not in the mountains. 
And he's not in the trees and he's not in the animals and he's not in us. He is only connected to the word. That is it. This word. And that is the most mysterious thing about human beings, is this word and talking. I cover this whole subject a lot more in my time series. But the point is this. That breaks the idea of participation. Interestingly enough, at the same, around the same time period, the Greeks were also starting to break participation through their use of science. And they began to open up the material reality and discuss it. Now, they didn't go all the way. They went part of the way and started to create a world we could look at. But it took the development of... He talks about the Middle Ages and and all of this. Basically, go listen to Rookmacher's What is Reality lecture for the true significance of Barfield's ideas. But the point is this. This is Barfield's major work. And what he basically says is when we come to materialistic reality of modern science... We now have idolatry. And the idolatry is that, for instance, maybe in the past, uh, a person was walking through the forest and suddenly lightning came and struck a tree. Now, I've never seen lightning strike a tree. I could imagine that would be a pretty powerful event. But this person from the past would have seen lightning strike the tree. This would not be a random event for this person. They would be totally participating in it. This would be an omen. This would be a message. So then what might happen is maybe people would want to see this tree. So he'd bring them out and they'd say, look at the tree. This is where this amazing event happened. And then eventually maybe what they would do is they would carve a piece of the tree. And this is the tree that lightning struck. Maybe they carve it, you know, you can imagine carving it lightning-shaped or something. Well, by this time, you've made an idol of the reality. The the depth of what that means is one thing. But now you've brought brought it down to this physical thing. And after a while, people just bow and scrape to the physical object. And they don't even know why. That's idolatry. And that's what we've done to the world. We've taken the meaning and the depth of it. And Barfield says, essentially, we've just turned it into solid objects. But then he ends by talking about final participation, which is not for him synonymous with good. And that's one of the big problems people have, is they think, oh, if we just participate again, everything will be good. And Barfield is not saying that, because he, he makes it explicit, we participate finally by choosing to do things that used to be natural to do. For instance, you have to choose to sing together because people don't naturally do it anymore because we've got too much junk in our ears. Literally. So, how do you choose to do that? Well, you, it's an act of imagination. And Barfield is really, in some sense, continues the romantic philosophies and, and creates an act of the imagination. But, and it's a huge warning, but, it says, we must not imagine that the, uh, must not think that the imagination is synonymous with good. So, in other words, people can start reimagining the world and end up with the Third Reich. They can start reimagining the world and end up with the chaos of technology we have. That's not a good. So final participation for Barfield is an act of choice, which should be good. Even the good has to be chosen. So I'm just going to leave that there. Everything else of Barfield's essentially comes back to these ideas. So, history and English words, which I mentioned. Poetic diction is uh, a study in meaning, is his really scholarly work. Uh, history and English words is pretty easy to read. Poetic diction is a bit more difficult, but has all the real uh, examples and footnotes that explain his ideas on how, well, he uses the phrase evolution of consciousness, how our view of the world through our consciousness has changed. Um, And I don't think Barfield, well, I know from reading him, Barfield did not have a lot of sympathy with uh, psychedelic uh, experimentation. Because for Barfield, the point was not, again, imagination is not simply good. Barfield was not interested in just um, our perception. 
because perception can be really easily deceived. He was interested in the what's inside, and what's inside can only be found through a rediscovery of meaning. And he has a, a book called The Rediscovery of Meaning and Other Essays, and there's at least some of those books, uh, essays, some of those essays are a bit abstract, uh, but at least half of that book is really good, including The Coming Trauma of Materialism is a great essay. Also, I recommend Worlds Apart, which is a great dialogue that he wrote, almost a kind of a Socratic dialogue between different people. Uh, one a scientist, one, uh, you know, philologist, one, uh, you know, different people from different points of view. And of course, one of them is like Barfield uh, and kind of has this, these Steiner ideas. A friend of mine says uh, there'll be a point where Barfield starts Steinering. And that's when you kind of have to go, okay, and just look the other way for a while. But, when Barfield is on, particularly in Saving the Appearances, he is completely on. Charles Williams is another inkling who is quite important with quite a few interesting ideas. Probably the least studied in terms of his ideas. Uh, Williams was very heavily involved with symbolism and knew his arcane symbolism. In fact, one of his most interesting books is called Witchcraft, and it is probably the most intelligent Christian study on the subject. Uh, it's not one that endorses any sort of Wiccan practices, nor is it one that condemns every person who uh, touches magical things as, uh, you know, an evil heretic. He really takes a balanced position and also shows the genuine evil of the past as evil, but also talks, you know, he basically is very highly skeptical of some of the newer interpretations. He wrote this book in, I believe this was, yeah, well, it was in about 1940 or so. Uh, he Came Down from Heaven is a great, very short book he wrote about his ideas of substitution as far as how we could substitute, you know, we could suffer for other people in substitution for them. Um, and also how this relates back to the story of Christ. Um, the figure of Beatrice, uh, Beatrice from, uh, Dante's Inferno. This for me is Bar, uh, this for me is William's greatest work because what he does in talking about, uh, Beatrice from, uh, the Inferno and the Divine Comedy, he talks about how this image of a person becomes an image of the reflection of God. And in doing so, you can then start to apply that to all of us. You can look around and start to see that reflection, the divine reflection of God in other people. Similarly, he has another book called The Image of the City and other essays. And this essay, The Image of the City, is also about a similar thing. How the city becomes... Interestingly enough, Jacques Ellul also has a book called The Meaning of the City. And uh, in... And what Elul says, and I think this correlates in many ways with what Williams is saying, is that interestingly enough, at the beginning of the Bible, the first image that God gives us of a paradise is of a garden. It's not a wilderness. It's a garden. It's something we tend. But the final image in the book of Revelation is not of a garden. It is of a city. The city, as Elul points out, is what we made in our pride, because the city is often the place of pride. The people living in cities today almost always feel, especially the intellectuals and the artists and the, the, the rulers, the movers, the shakers, always feel superior to the people in the country. The, the city is a place of our you know, greatest achievements. It's a place of our big buildings. And what uh, Elul says is, but God takes the city and redeems it and turns it into the heavenly city, the new Jerusalem. The city which really is a foul, stinking place, and they are, and I've lived in New York and uh, certainly lived near San Francisco, and I am now living in a city of over a million people, Tbilisi, Georgia. Cities are not great places. They are filled with misery and filled with despair. But, you know, that's human life. So, but, but Elul points out that the image that God uses in the end, and this is also what Williams points out, the image of the city is an image of redemption, of our choices before God. 
So a few figures here who are connected to the uh, Inklings, but not in any direct sort of way. And one is G.K. Chesterton, who is an influence on almost all the Inklings. And some of the books I would highly recommend, his book Heretics, which came first. It's his uh, view of modernism. These are from the early 20th century. Also, Orthodoxy. These two books are, go together and are quite good. They are books from a Catholic point of view, but they really look at the world, as does his book, What's Wrong with the World and The Everlasting Man. And basically any essays by G.K. Chesterton are always worth reading. And he often has the most pithy, ironic, wise comments that you could possibly imagine. And I really appreciate Chesterton. And Chesterton is like, to me, he's like a fine wine. He's aged well. He's almost in the classic category, but still connected enough to the modern world that I think we can get a lot from him. But he's almost fading back into the other category I said I wasn't going to mention. As well as uh, Dorothy Sayers, who wrote uh, many detective novels with Lord Peter Whimsey. But she had a couple of uh, books and that I would recommend. One is her translation of just Dante's uh, Inferno. She unfortunately didn't finish the whole Divine Trilogy, uh, the Divine Comedy, but she did write that. Another is her book, The Mind of the Maker, where she uh, takes the our creativity and relates it back to the Trinity. It creates essentially the, uh, our reflect, the reflection of creativity back to God and how that relates. And another book called Are Women Human? Now, Dorothy Sayers was one of the first women to go to Oxford University. So she was certainly no, um, you know, stay-at-home mom. But she was also very much... Uh, had problems with the kind of hysterical, you know, women should just wear pants. Women should do everything men do. And she, she argued, like, why? Why who would want to wear pants? They're ugly. I mean, many pants really are ugly. And so it, it, she, it's a very common sense take in her essay on that. And finally, for this episode, looks like I'm going to turn this into two episodes here on uh, book recommendations. So this will be book recommendations, part one. Finally, T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot was an acquaintance of C.S. Lewis. I don't know if friends would be quite appropriate, but nevertheless, uh, they certainly knew each other. And Lewis appreciated uh, T.S. Eliot and at the same time was very critical of his poetry. However, I would say this. Uh, the Four Quartets is to my thinking, the greatest poem of the 20th century. And it is deep. It discusses the effect of time upon us. And all I can say is this. You really have to read it. And a great thing to do is to go on YouTube, look for someone's got him reading the whole thing, listen to him read it, and then listen to him again reading it with the poem in front of you. Also, he has a book, uh, Christianity and Culture. It's an essay. There's a couple of essays in this book, though. And that that's very valuable. But T.S. Eliot is quite a deep thinker. I highly recommend him. And in part two of uh, my book recommendations, we will cover somehow this ended up as a series. I wanted to do this in one thing, but I just talked too much. Forgive me. Anyway, in part two, we're going to uh, discuss French thinkers like Jacques Ellul, Paul Virilio, also Russian people like uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn and Tar the great uh, filmmaker Andrzej Tarkovsky, who wrote an amazing book on art. We'll also discuss Michael Polanyi's uh, work in science, uh, Walker Percy, and probably other people. So come back very soon. This will show up very soon. I didn't want this to be a long, drawn-out series, so we'll do part two uh, in just a bit. Meanwhile, you're here. You could subscribe. You could like the channel. You could uh, share it because these YouTube algorithms have don't know the stuff exists yet. Uh, share it uh, if you find it interesting. And feel free to comment, make any sort of... I like hearing what people have to say. And fortunately, I don't have uh, so many people watching this right now that uh, I can't get around to... Uh, 
responding to you. So leave a, leave a word. But anyway, thanks for watching. Remember, anadromous means swimming against the stream. So do that, and uh, I'll see you very soon. A people without a history is not redeemed from time. For history is a pattern of timeless moments.